Well, welcome everybody. Great to see you all uh, back at our um, seventh iteration of the CMFI MassSpec seminar. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to, a uh, very great pleasure to have Robin Schmidt today uh, giving the, the, le uh, the lecture. And uh, Robin is gonna walk you through in a little bit um, how to process LCMS MS data with MZMind3. But yeah, before he gets started, um, uh, I just wanna uh, give a little introduction. So Robin uh, did his uh, bachelor's and master's in food chemistry at the University um, of Münster, where he then also did his PhD um, in the group of um, Uwe Kast. Uh, during his uh, uh, PhD, that was mainly like wet lab focused. I think it became already very clear that uh, he has quite some interest in, in software development. Um, uh, and he became part of like the MZ Mine uh, developing team. He also spent a couple of months uh, visiting us in San Diego back then, where yeah, he basically developed like the the basis uh, uh, for ion identity molecular networking. And yeah, since then has become I think uh, one of the main developers or the main developer of of MZ Mine three now, um, and is now also a postdoc in in the lab of of Peter Dorstein. And yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to have him showcase like the brand new. Um, MZ Mine uh, 3 here. So yeah, without uh, further ado, welcome Robin and thanks a lot for um, giving the lecture today. Thanks Danny and uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, I think it's a great, uh, great that Daniel put together such a nice uh, set of uh, presentations and, and I'm, I'm honored to be in a line of uh, great speakers already, having uh, Tomas who already Introduced MZ Mine and uh, feature finding uh, last time. And I think Daniel's going to present uh, molecular networking or do a hands on molecular networking soon. So, um, in this presentation, we're going to uh, produce the files that we need for feature, fi feature based molecular networking. But also, we're going to just look into raw data in uh, MZ Mine 3. I'm going to share my screen um, here. And I just want to highlight that uh, MS3, which is the third uh, major release. Um, many of you might have already used MS2, and I think it's time to uh, try out MS3. It's uh, way more performant. We also put so much effort in um, making it more modular and more interactive. So the uh, graphical user faces, which was already the strong side of MS3, is uh, even better now. And you can always find the new releases here. And also like if you're very uh, interested in the latest releases, it's like the latest development release. But if you find any bugs, if you find any issues, or if you uh, want to find more features in empty mine, uh, you can create an issue here and then maybe someone's gonna work on it. I mean, we definitely try to answer everything and uh, maybe we find more people to also collaborate. And empty mine, as Daniel said, is a collaborative uh, project. We already uh, work with so many different people together and from so many different universities. So it's great uh, to see the project really take off. And so from here, I would like to uh, start a hands-on session. So uh, you can open MZ Mine, and I hope you all like install, everyone who wants to follow along, install this. Uh, we're also gonna upload the video later um, to, to uh, YouTube. And so people can also like follow along later uh, with the video. I am going to share uh, just one link in the, in the chat um, just for everyone who wants to follow along, but then gets lost at like one step. We also prepared all the parameters and all the steps that we're using here in this like slideshow. And so you can follow along with those parameters that we can use. Okay, so first of all, we open MC Mine, and the easiest way to import data is actually to just uh, take, take the raw data files and then drag and drop those raw data files into the list on the left side. If we do this, and we can do this with M MC Mail. Unmute. All right, I think I was muted for a while or something. Um, so we can just drag and drop the files in here. It's MCML, MCXML, and some other file formats also from vendors are supported. Uh, so we can just drag and drop them here. Or 
um, we have all the different import uh, formats here. And one easy way is also to use the MS data import. And here it's quite nice because you can just select in subfolders. And then for example, say, I only want to select MSML files. And then I use the uh, data folder and it's just gonna grab all the MSML files in the subdirectories and list them here. And so with this, we can also import data. So clicking okay, we just end up with the same list of files here. Um, the one way to visualize raw data is to double click on a file. If we do this, uh, the raw data overview opens up and we can directly see the chromatogram. It's a base peak chromatogram here. We can also switch it to um, the total ion chromatogram, but so usually it's a, a base peak. And if I click at any point here, we can directly visualize the spectrum on the right side and we can also like zoom in by dragging the axis. We can zoom into some regions. And um, what is also interesting, it directly picks the highest mass. So it, if I click somewhere, it's going to pick the highest mass, is going to visualize the extracted ion chromatogram from this mass. And so if I also zoom in, I can also click on another mass. And then I see, okay, this mass is actually just the remainder of this peak and so on. So it's quite easy to just navigate uh, raw data here. And if I check on this little checkbox on the top here, I can actually uh, select multiple files at a time. And from here, we can see the differences in the files. And we can also visualize multiple spectra at the same time. And why am I saying that? It's, I think, the easiest way to estimate the noise level of your um, MS data. So if we just click at some points, uh, we can see that the, that the noise level here, there's usually a static noise level in the um, spectrum. So I zoom out, I only zoom in on the Y. We can usually see that there's some like static noise level in the bottom that's from the mass, mass spec and uh, data processing. And from here, we uh, can go on and start our data processing. So I close this and selecting the first step that we can do is mass detection. And from here, your raw data might be in profile mode or it might be already centroided. So in profile mode data, you have like a peak shape in each spectrum. And in, in for centroid data, of course, uh, we already did peak picking and we only have the MZ and the intensity for each signal. Um, this is already centroided, so we use the centroid mass detector. We do setup, and we're going to set up the MS1 level first. So with this, I looked into the uh, noise level just in the raw data overview, and I saw it's around about uh, 3E5. Sending it up and also setting the filter to MS level 1. So clicking on set filters, MS level 1 we can first apply it to all raw data files. Okay, and it's very fast, so you don't really see, but each task that we add is usually in the bottom here and is already finished. If we do mass detection again, again, centroid, because the MS2 scans are very often, they have a different noise level. And so first we set it to MS level two, then we set up the noise level. And for this, we can also show it in the preview. So I can tick on the preview and some of the um, steps that we're gonna do have some previews here. And I just jump down to the point where we acquire MS2 spectra. And so this is an MS2 spectrum. We can see it here from MS2 and the precursor MZ. The precursor is also marked here as a dashed line. And then we see all the signals. And from this, I would say that uh, maybe the noise level is like three E3 but we can set it up a little bit higher. So I would say um, 5E3. And you can see with the red dots that we have here on the, on the signals, that is the signals that remain. So we are, we are filtering out all the signals below the noise level. And we've already done that for MS1. And now we are only gonna do this with a different noise level for MS2. And 
Okay, and it's already done. So I think it's very important to state that it's when you change the settings of your instrument, the noise level usually changes. And so you just have to look into your raw data files, change it, and then it's usually quite constant if you use the same method. And now we use all the raw data files. And in the next step, we go for LCMS ADAP Chromatogram Builder. The menus are a bit different from MCMI2, but the modules are mostly the same. And then here we can also select all raw data files. We can select some scans. And just going from the um, chromatogram here again, the chromatogram has like nine minutes length and usually the first uh, 0.5 minutes or so are diverted into waste. So we don't really record uh, our sample. And this we can use when we set up the chromatogram filter. So if we go on the set filters, we can cut the chromatogram at 0.3 minutes and at eight minutes when we start the washout. Then we set MS level one because we don't want to build chromatograms of MS level two, only MS one, and said, okay. The minimum number of uh, data points, or minimum group size of data points, number of scans, okay, is just the data points of the chromatogram that you want. So um, four data points is already low, but because we have a high MS2 acquisition rate, I think it's a good uh, point to start with four data points. Then we have the um, intensity threshold, which is again a noise level. So we already introduced a noise level with the mass detection. But here we can just say we want four data points above this level. And it is just the same level that we use for mass detection in MS1. Then we use the minimum height, which is of course uh, just like maybe double the noise level. And here I just use like a bit less, like 5E5. And we use an um, MC tolerance to group the signals. So when we go from one scan to the next scan and throughout the whole chromatogram, we now want to find the same MC within this MC range. And when we hit OK, we can see it's applied to six uh, samples. It runs and it's already done. So we can see switching now from the data files to the feature lists, we can now see we have created feature lists. And just to show what we've created, we can double click on the chromatograms and this just opens up the feature table. In this, in this case, of course, it's the, um, it's the chromatograms that we've built. And we can see some of them still contain multiple features for the same master chart ratio. And so in the next step, we want to split those uh, chromatograms into separate features. So if we go on feature detection, we can apply some different methods here, like smoothing and so on. But for this, um, because the feature shapes looked, looked uh, very smooth already, we can directly go to chromatogram resolving and local minimum resolver. In MZMI2, this was the chromatogram deconvolution. The local minimum resolver also has a preview. So we can go on, hit preview. We can make it a bit larger. And from here, we can just select one of the chromatograms, like one of the lists of chromatograms. And it's directly choosing uh, some like different chromatograms to show. For example, here, it shows one that has uh, multiple features. And we can already see how the algorithm goes through the chromatogram and splits the chromatogram into separate features. And just by optimizing this, um, for example, we are searching for a minimum in a time range of 0.04. If we just go higher, uh, we actually end up just merging more features. This workshop is not about like optimizing everything to the end. So we're only gonna like stick with the settings that we now have. But it's really good to like play around with some of the settings, like the noise level. We have the minimum ratio of top to edge and minimum number of data points. And with this, you can see like how good you are at separating your features. But then you should also look at some like noisy chromatograms, maybe from some background signals, um, to see that you're not picking those as like 1,000 features. Because if you're doing something wrong, you're going to have 1,000 noise features and only a few uh, good features. 
So we can apply those settings here. So we just use the chromatography threshold, 80% and so on. You can find those settings again in the, in the slides that I shared. And I already did something wrong. So I only selected one sample here. So I can uh, remove the feature list again. I select all the samples. And then again, local minimum resolver. Um, the settings are the same. It keeps the settings. So as selected in the main window and okay. And now it actually resolved all the different um, for all the different samples. And we can see in MC-3, we now have like all the different samples and then multiple feature lists, like each individual step um, just resolved. And I think it's a good way because then you can go back and kind of like troubleshoot where did something go wrong. So um, in the process, uh, you can then see where did I lose my feature of interest? And then you have, can optimize your settings. From here, we can select all the resolved ones. And then uh, we go on and de-isotope. So in the feature list, we will find uh, some isotope, 30C isotope logs of our main masses. Um, it's a data set of small molecules. Um, so it's just a, a microbe extract. And then um, to get rid of those isotope signals, we apply, I do it again. So we go on a feature list method, isotopes, and then 13C isotope filter. And from here, um, we just set up an MC tolerance and retention time tolerance to find isotope signals that we can remove them from the feature list. And so we have just some like very basic settings. The mass tolerance can be very low because it's from the same sample. So uh, there shouldn't be like a huge shift between the main mass that we see and the 13C isotope loads. Then the retention time tolerance can also be very um, low because isotope loads usually co-elute, so they have the same retention time. And then because it's small molecules, we can set up the monotonic shape. So the first mass is going to be the most abundant. And then a maximum charge of two is very, uh, is very common for small molecules. And one option that we added in MC-3 is the never remove features with MS-2. So especially for molecular networking, you're uh, interested in, in MS2 features or like in MS2 spectra. And um, this option I think is, is interesting because if the instrument thought this is something that is valuable to fragment, why should we filter it out in the process of like the isotoping here and also later on? And with this, I selected all the feature lists here, the resolved ones, and I click OK is going to create a new feature list. Just to see what it does without actually looking into details, we can right click and look at the feature list summary. And we can see it's uh, now like 2,000 2, um, features that we detected. And just before we had 2,500. Of course, each main mass might have multiple isotope signals. And from here, we're going to align the samples because uh, of course for statistics and for any downstream analysis, we need to have a data matrix. And the alignment is the join aligner. And from here, um, we can select all the de-isotope samples like this. Or uh, we could just set up a feature list name pattern. And I think that's important because if you run multiple samples, if you run hundreds of samples, you don't want to select them manually. Um, so if you do feature this name pattern, you can just type in star de-isotoped. So star is just going to match anything before de-isotoped. And this way, it directly selects, MZMA directly selects the de-isotoped feature list. We set up some uh, MZ tolerance between the samples. So how much vary the uh, features between the samples. We set up retention time and then we can hit OK to align the feature lists. So now we have one feature list with all the different samples as columns and the features being aligned by their MZ and retention time. And we can already see that 
we have some uh, missing features, but especially when we sort by height, for example, the major features, um, they should be um, in the same samples. And we can see we have two sample groups. We always have the uh, iron addition to the samples and then without iron. And we can see that in those three samples, it was not detected and in the other samples, it was detected. And also in the feature table, we can directly see the feature shapes. And of course, the retention time should be the same because we aligned by the uh, retention time. But then uh, we could see like how much they vary. And in those six samples, at least, we don't see like much of a retention time shift. Okay, and from the aligned feature list, we might want to go and uh, filter uh, some features that don't, um, that don't uh, fit to our requirements. So we go on featureless methods and then featureless filtering. And there's the featureless rows filter, which is one of the most basic filters, but it allows us to um, define some constraints for the features and for the rows. So minimum features in a row, uh, we can now set up that we at least need to find the feature in two uh, samples because we ran them in triplicates. Or we could say we want to find the features in actually 50% of the samples. Yeah, so you can either do it as an absolute number or just as a ratio of the samples. We're gonna just, just filter by uh, two features. Yeah, so I'm just gonna type in two samples. Um, so two samples, and again, we have the option to never remove features with MS2. There's just the option to keep everything that the mass spec thinks is important. Now we have um, the filtered aligned feature list and we're still gonna see that we have some holes in the feature list. So again, for example, looking at uh, those three samples here, those are holes in the feature list. And if we now want to apply statistics, or if we don't want to do downstream analysis, it's usually wise to um, try to uh, look, look back into the raw data and try to see if there is some intensity. If we just missed it, maybe it's just very small in those samples. And so from here, we can apply gap filling. And I think gap filling is like very controversial and also misunderstood. But I think for statistical analysis, it, it can be like very important because it's just an informed second feature finding. So we already did a first feature finding, and now we have the MZs and retention times in multiple samples, and we can use this information to try and go back and find those little features that we were just missing before. So we can use an intensity tolerance. That's a tolerance for the shape. So as soon as the shape drops, we say the feature is like finished. When the intensity goes up again, or just hit zero. So we set it to 20% here. We have a uh, relatively like normal uh, end tolerance for an Orbitrap uh, instrument and then retention time tolerance. We've seen that there was not like a big shift in retention time. And if we hit okay, uh, we can see that the gap filled feature list now also has some features here in gray and those are the gap filled features. Okay, and from here, I would like to uh, export everything that we need for running molecular networking, feature-based molecular networking on uh, GMPS. And we also want to export directly um, the, everything that we need for compound annotation in series. Um, so series is a tool for uh, compound annotation based on MS2 and MS1 information. And I think it's very, like one of the best tools actually to use and we do have connection in MCMind to multiple different tools. And I would say the best way is just to use the export function, use their tools because they update them uh, regularly. And then you can just use the MGF file, which contains all the spectral information you can use later on, even in like updated versions from them. So going back here, we select a feature list, we go on, um, we go on, feature list methods export. And we're gonna first export the feature-based molecular networking files. So here we just select any uh, folder and give a, a file name. 
then we select the basics here. So everything can stay like this. Um, it just means we filter the rows. We use the peak area as the intensity. We could also use the height, uh, but here we're going to use peak area. And then CSV export uh, can be anything of this. Uh, comprehensive is just like a, to the whole feature table, like you see it, everything combined. Uh, but GPS actually only uses some parts of it, so the simple is just fine. And this is the MC Mine 2 uh, feature list that some people might have been used to export. And if I hit OK, um, it also directly opens the folder if I set it to do that. And we can see that we actually export three different files. And so in the next workshop, you're going to see that uh, the MGF file is used as a spectral information. So we have all the MS2 um, spectra, so one MS2 spectrum for each feature. And then we have the uh, quant file. This one we don't actually have. We have the quant file, which is the feature uh, table. So just the area for each sample, and then the MZ retention time and some basic information. And then we're also going to export the series files. So we go on uh, series. And from here, we just set it up like this, export, and we get a different MGF file for series. And so the reason why we have two different exports uh, for the same file format is um, GMPS uses different information than series. Series also uses the MS1 spectra to look at the isotope pattern. And that's why we usually export two different files. Okay, and so this is like the basic workflow, uh, how you can run in like MC Mine and uh, do feature finding, align over different samples and then export and connect to other tools. And of course we did this now manually. And I think one of the strengths in MC Mine is that um, for like hundreds of samples, you don't want to really do it manually, but MC Mine allows you to do it in a batch mode. So, and the batch mode, um, got way easier now. Uh, we did everything manually, we optimized, and if I now right click on the feature list, we can go again to the feature list summary, and from the summary, we can actually just directly open um, the open this, this batch in the batch queue. So if I click on it, um, it directly opens up all the different steps that we did. So we see the import MS data, it also has the files that we imported, it has all the settings here for MS1 and MS2 level. And we can also see that um, it directly set the, the steps to run in a sequence. So this option is only available in batch mode. And it's just like those created by previous batch steps. So after the import, master detection is going to grab the files that were imported and going to process it in a pipeline. Then we have the chromatogram builder and everything that we applied up to the um, peak finder. The exports are not in here because they are not really applied to the method, to the feature list. They don't change the feature list, but you would have to just go and say, okay, I want to add the GMPS export. Okay, that's not the one. So feature IO and then down here, series export and this one, export submit GMPS feature based. Well, like then it working. And from here, we can just add more steps and then save the batch mode as a batch file and then just reuse it later on. Hey, Robin, why yeah. don't you just save it and share it with everybody? I'm sure they would be yeah. all uh, appreciate just starting off from, from your batch. So then we can share the URL um, together um, yeah. with like the video later. Yeah, I think we're gonna share it with the video so that people can just reiterate and uh, actually download the files and do everything. Um, and yeah, like, so this is like one of the easiest ways to build your batch, batch mode. And of course you can save it. Uh, you can also load some, some other batch files here very easily. And, um, another way that I would like to highlight is if you don't want to start like optimizing manually, there's also now the processing wizard and I'm not going into details, but the processing wizard is, um, designed to make it easy to set up a standard batch file 
Of course, the batch file for different process, like different workflows might look differently, but usually the order of the steps is very similar. So we could set up some defaults here and of course, like change some parameters like the noise level in MS1, noise level in MS2. And then if we click on build batch, it actually populates a whole batch with uh, a bunch of different steps like smoothing and some other stuff. I'm not going to go into detail here, it's just to show you there is the processing wizard and it's actually quite nice to set up as like standard batch mode, but you still have to optimize it. Of course. Um, and so from here, I would like to uh, do like a little bit of uh, compound annotation uh, because I think it's a very strong side of, of MZ Mind that is underappreciated by some. And we uh, made some real efforts to um, optimize it. So in case you've downloaded any kind of uh, spectral database, you can just go and I just downloaded here like the Mona, Mass Bank of North America, uh, LCMS MS positive mode library. I can directly drag and drop the file into MC Mine, or again, I can just use the MS data import. And at the same time, when I import um, the raw data files, I can already import the spectral libraries as well. So later on in the process, I can do spectral library matching directly in MC Mine. So now we have- Robin, uh, maybe yeah. can I just add one thing? So yeah. importantly, um, for everybody who wants to follow next time uh, with the feature-based molecular networking, which we're gonna do in a future um, seminar here. So I think right now, this is the time where you should have exported like the, the files that you need from there. And now everything else from now on, what Robin is gonna show you, I think are like all really cool new um, uh, features um, for MZMind3, but they're not required. Um, for totally. the um, feature-based molecular network and stuff. So it's kind of, there's there's some redundancy, but yeah, uh, me personally, uh, I'm stoked to see now how uh, Robin is going to annotate directly the MS MS spectra, but just yeah, to, totally. to navigate you a little bit. Totally, Daniel's right. Like um, we did the basic feature finding, we exported everything for uh, feature-based molecular networking, and we also exported for series. And this is the important part, like how to connect MZMine results actually to other tools that do a great job in like creating molecular network, uh, networks, linking information. And uh, I just want to display how uh, MZ Mind can also like help you to directly understand your samples and to directly annotate what you actually uh, measured. So in like we, we imported the spectral library, uh, we have now like nearly 100 uh, spectra in here, reference spectra. And if we go to the feature list, uh, of course we select the latest one. So the latest aligned feature list and we go on feature list methods annotation and it's a spectra method. So we're gonna annotate spectra, spectral library search. And from here, um, there's like plenty of settings. Um, most of them you don't need for a standard uh, library matching. So with a spectral library um, as reference, we're going to match on MS level two. This is important if you run GCMS, it's usually MS level one. And then we're going to match the precursor MZ of our precursors to the library. And because the library also contains like um, precursor information from like a lower res mass spec, we usually set up a, like a higher MZ tolerance here. We also set up a higher tolerance for actually the spectral signals in the MS2 spectra. Yeah, so we set up a higher tolerance. We um, define the minimum number of matched signals. We just define six here because then we usually get very confident matches. For small molecules, of course, we can go lower, maybe to four signals. And then when we click on setup, we can use the weighted dot product, which is the cosine similarity, which is used by um, GenePS and by several other uh, tools. And we can just set up a minimum cosine similarity of 0.7. And so if we do this, we're now going to match the 100,000 uh, spectra of our library to, let's see, our 2,500 uh, features, Maybe not all of them have MS2 spectra, but uh, still, and we're already done. So if we open up the feature list now, 
um, we can see that we have new columns. And so these new columns always add when you perform new steps. And we could directly um, sort them by cosine similarity. And with this, we see that we have a bunch of different, different molecules here. And for example, I know that Fusernobactin is one of them. And just by going on right click, show, and then spectral DB search results, we can open up the spectral library match. And from here, we can directly see uh, on the top, we have the experimental spectrum. And on the bottom, we have the library spectrum. We also have some information uh, that was shared in the library. So we know it's a QTOF instrument. Um, we don't know the exact branch, but still we know um, the neutral mass and so on and the structure, which is also like drawn up here. And I think it's quite nice because uh, you can see that in the QTOF, or at least in this reference spectrum, we have uh, several isotope signals that were not matched in our uh, Orbitrap spectrum because we have a narrow uh, isolation, precursor isolation window. And so all the signals were matched. We have a high score and that's like a confident library match and annotation. And so from here, you can just go and explore what kind of molecules uh, you found. So again, spectral library match, and we can see that we can also have multiple different matches because the libraries usually contain different collision energies and also from different instruments. Okay, so this was like only one of the methods, you, how you can annotate spectra or how, can, how you can annotate features in MZMind. You can also predict formulas, you can do other stuff. And we're trying to actually um, improve the documentation so that people can also more easily find it. And we're also going to publish some videos on that so that you can find yourself uh, more in, in MC Mind 3. And I don't know about the time, but um, I think from here, I would like to show some like feature grouping and uh, ion density networking. Because if we do LCMS analysis, like one thing that like people who look manually into data, they usually look for like the M plus H signal and then like plus 22, they, they try to find the sodiated adducts and like different, different ion forms that were uh, generated in the electro spray. Um, and so this is something that we can also automatically do in MC Mine. And we're just going down here. Like when we scroll down the feature table, we will usually find uh, some features that have the same retention time and that also have the same shape. And so we're using this information to now um, go in our, uh, our feature list again and apply feature grouping as a first step. So again, a bit slower, we go on feature grouping and metacorrelate, which is a method that has multiple different ways of grouping features that belong to the same molecule. So it's the same molecule, loose at one specific time point and ionizes in different ions. So first, we usually set up a retention time range that we think our different ions should uh, belong to or should be found in. Um, the retention time tolerance should be very low because it's the same molecule. There's no big difference in the M plus sodium and M plus H ions. Then we can set up a uh, correlation grouping. And with a correlation grouping, we look at the feature shape and the standard settings are usually quite good to differentiate between features that are slightly shifted and don't belong together and those features from different ions. And if we just applied those uh, standard settings, we have to select a, a feature list and of course uh, those created by previous batch step don't work in the manual, uh, manual way. So we do as select the main window, we select the feature list and then we apply the method. And it's already done. We created a new feature list now with uh, grouped features. And before we look at the results, uh, we're directly going to try to annotate those features 
that are M plus sodium and M plus H2 to each other. So we go on featureless methods and then feature grouping, ion identity networking. From here, uh, we can set up an MZ tolerance. It should be very low because um, ions are found in the same sample. So the MZ shouldn't be too different from each other. So they should fall in a very short, um, um, very small tight window. And then we can set up the ion identity library. And we're only going to use like the most common adducts here. Um, you can also explore later what kind of adducts you find in your analysis. Um, that really depends on your acquisition parameters and also the sample that you're analyzing. But we're going to use uh, M plus H, M plus sodium, potassium, ammonium, and a doubly charged um, protonated version. And we're only going to include uh, one water loss here, just the main adducts. Um, for the annotation refinement, it doesn't really matter what you set up here. This is the standard method we usually use. Um, you can just use this. I'm going to uh, show in the results what it actually does. So if we hit OK and again select the latest feature list and press OK, it's done. And if we open the feature list, we can now see we still have the library matches here. I'm going to make them uh, disappear just for a while. So total library matches, they are gone. So up here, you can directly easily get rid of uh, or like include or exclude the library matches from the table or the ion identities. And now you can see that ion identities also appeared in the feature table. Now, if we uh, sort by, by MZ, and then sort by the ion identity ID, we can see that now multiple ion identities are grouped together. And we can also sort by size, so we can see already uh, a group of ions that all represent the same feature. So we can see uh, they all have the same ion ID. They all point to the same neutral mass. And um, they were identified as different ion species. So we have a water loss here with M plus H, M plus sodium, and so on. And this is done automatically because we grouped the features before based on the retention time and the feature shape. And now we just gave a library of um, mass charge ratio deltas um, that we allow to, to like being matched together. Yeah, so, and this information, of course, uh, can also be shared with other tools. So Sirius and also GMPS can make use of this information, but this is not mandatory. That's just like downstream analysis that you can do and that you can also do to inform the molecular networks that you might be using later on. And like this, we can see that multiple different, um, multiple different molecules were found and Obviously, I would trust those more that were detected with multiple different, multiple different ion species because then we have multiple um, features pointing to the same molecule and also pointing to the same neutral mass. And this is why uh, in this ion identity networking refinement that we did, so feature grouping, ion identity networking, and then the last step here, refinement, we set up that if, if we have a network with um, four ion identities, we say we don't want to see all the other possibilities. Yeah, so of course, that's just like a very simple analysis. And this might also be annotated as different ion species. But if we have one network that says there's like four different others saying this is the M plus H that we're actually interested in, I want to trust those four instead of like trusting just a different spurious correlation. So let me see. Yeah, and from this, I would say um, you can just go and explore MC Mine. Um, there is different other modules and uh, feel free, um, especially if you're like a programmer, Feel free to reach out and uh, also optimize MZMind as, a, as an open community. 
Uh, we're very inviting uh, for any kind of contributions. It can be a very small contribution, a very simple filter, and also for every user, um, don't hesitate to uh, go to the MC Mind GitHub and then also share your issues. Um, but maybe also if you uh, feel like the documentation doesn't address something properly, go to the documentation and then try to like maybe commit and try to optimize the documentation. And it's very easy to commit some, some changes there. And with this, I think I would go, uh, I would be open to some questions. Hey, Robin, before we start uh, our question session, yeah. um, do you may want to like export this latest uh, IIN edge file too? So then perhaps okay. we could already use that in the feature based molecular network okay, next yeah. time as well. Yeah, we can, um, we can easily do that. So, um, as Daniel said, um, or as I also said, we, we now have additional information in, in the feature table and we can share this information with TeamPS. So we can just select the latest feature list. We can go on um, feature list methods and export feature-based molecular networking. And then here, I'm just gonna give it a different name. I am calling it IIMN because it's Iron Identity Molecular Networking. That's the uh, workflow that is associated when we have multiple layers of um, network connecti connectivity. So if we add the ion identities to it, and from here, um, we don't have to select anything else. So it all goes the same. We can export and it opens the folder and we can see now we actually have um, three different files. We just have one edge file. And in this edge file, there's just the basic information of um, these four ion identities that we see, these four ion identities being connected by MS1 information. So later on in, in GPS, we're going to connect uh, features based on their MS2 fragmentation pattern similarity. And here we connect them based on MS1 information and we could share this information with GPS to create more dense and complex networks. Okay, now I'm clicking everything, but that's basically the, um, the table that we exported as well. So very, very basic table with the connectivity. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Robin, for um, this quick run through. And yeah, before we now uh, continue with, with the question in a second, uh, just uh, wanted to thank again, Robin and everybody for joining. And yeah, um, as I um, mentioned, like next time we will like continue with like the data um, Robin exported and then generate um, a feature-based molecular network. So yeah, um, I hope uh, you're gonna join us there again or that you're gonna stay on now for the, for the questions. And yeah, see you next time and thanks.